Good afternoon, everyone. We're just gonna give folks a couple more minutes to join us. Okay, it's a little after 3.30, so we're gonna get started. Um, I know we're expecting some more attendees, but we have all our panelists. Um, so we're recording this. Um, so if anyone misses the beginning, we'll, they'll be able to um, catch up afterwards on the YouTube channel. So good afternoon and welcome to the CDTC New Visions Virtual Learning Series. My name is Jen Saponis, and I am the Director of Regional Planning at the Capital District Transportation Committee. Um, this webinar today is going to focus on pedestrian safety planning tools. So um, as most of you know, this is a webinar. Your mic is muted. You can see us. We can't see you. Please feel free to use the chat or the Q&A um, or raise your hand, and uh, we'll unmute you. Today's webinar has been approved for CM credits if you are an AICP planner. Um, also, if you are on a planning or zoning board and the municipality that um, you serve has approved CCC's webinars, you can get credit um, for New York State training requirements. And of course, today we're focusing on pedestrian safety planning because it is Pedestrian Safety Month. Um, we want to stress everyone is a pedestrian. Um, in 2020, there were over 6,000 pedestrians killed in traffic crashes in the U.S. And this equates to a traffic-related pedestrian death every 81 minutes. We have three panelists today. Uh, we have Carrie Ward, who's a senior planner here at the Capital Transportation Committee. We also have Joseph Chung, um, from the safety design team at the U.S. Department of Transportation Federal Highway Administration, and Nate Owens, who is a senior planner with the town of Bethlehem. So just a quick um, look at the agenda for today. Um, we've done the welcome and introductions. I'll give a brief overview of CDTC's new visions plan. Um, then we'll, I'll pass it to Carrie Ward, who will talk about pedestrian safety planning here at CDTC. Joseph Chung will talk about the Federal Highway's pedestrian lighting primer, and then Nate Owens will talk about Bethlehem's pedestrian safety efforts. We'll do a brief um, overview of safety planning resources and tools available to communities here in the region, and then open it up for questions and discussion. So one of CDTC's major products is our long range plan, the Metropolitan Transportation Plan, which we refer to as New Visions 2050. This is a blueprint for regional transportation that reflects a shared vision for the future. Um, this plan was de uh, developed collaboratively between transportation providers, local governments, state agencies, private sector stakeholders, and the public. And it is used to guide the prioritization and funding of federal investment decisions that are made here in the MPO process. And if you're wondering what it looks like um, when it's implemented or what does the Metropolitan Transportation Plan do, these are just some examples of major infrastructure investments that have been constructed because of the priorities and strategies laid out in previous plans. Um, we uh, used to be able to 
look at the previous 10 years, measure population growth, count building permits, estimate vehicle miles traveled, look at some other data and maps and make some pretty good assumptions about what the next 10 and 20 years will be like um, and what we should build for. We sometimes overestimated traffic growth in some places, underestimated in others, but for the most part, traditional planning strategies and funding model models worked for us here in the region. More recently, it seems they've been disrupted by big changes over a short period of time. Um, and we're anticipating some more changes, some more significant than others, possible disruptions. The last few years have been pretty significant disruptions to the transportation system as we've watched things change. Um, and then there's other growing issues and concerns that affect the transportation system, like the design of vehicles are getting larger, potential for autonomous vehicles, equity, electrification of the system, the ongoing climate crisis, new types of mobility, and even the growth of remote work. Funding uncertainty is always a challenge, um, but now also inflation and increasing costs of living. So bringing it back to pedestrian safety, um, looking at national trends. In 2016, there was a panic that pedestrian fatalities would reach 6,000, which would have been the most in decades. Um, and they did. And then in 2021, there were 7,485 pedestrian fatalities, which is the most in a single year um, in four decades. And this is a disproportionate number um, because uh, pedestrian uh, fatalities make up more than 16% of traffic fatalities and pedestrian trips are less than 11% of all trips in the U.S. In New York, um, the good news is that uh, pedestrian fatalities had been trending downward in New York. New York um, released its pedestrian safety plan uh, in 2016 and started making some strategic and targeted investments in pedestrian safety. Um, related to some of the things that we're going to talk about today in this webinar, uh, more pedestrian fatalities occur at nighttime. And the biggest increases in pedestrian fatalities, this is in New York State, so statewide, um, by month are August through November and um, probably also because that's when it does get darker. Um, so again, going back to lighting as a strategy for improving pedestrian safety. Here in the capital region, uh, we have a robust network of highways, bridges, sidewalks, trails, bike facilities, um, and a BRT system um, that connects it all. And the network exceeds a value um, of $30 billion. So we've continued to invest and expand this network over time. And as we've expanded our network of, particularly of walking and bicycling facilities, the number of people walking for all kinds of trips has increased throughout the region, which is consistent with CDC's, CDTC's goals of shifting trips uh, out of vehicles, improving air quality, and creating better and more accessible connections, but also means that more people are exposed to traffic violence and um, it increases the need to integrate safety and safety culture into transportation planning, roadway design, enforcement activities, and education of both drivers and pedestrians. Um, the New Visions plan uh, has some uh, big themes and one of them is safety and encouraging the adoption of safe systems and vision zero policies. Um, really looking at designing roads for safety over speed as the foundation for creating a safe system. And there's a set of 13 investment um, principles and strategies in New Visions 2050. These are really the spine of our plan and they influence how we prioritize funding throughout the region and what we work on. Investing in safety is very important to CDTC. We've continued to do it through all of our um, planning initiatives and the way we prioritize project in the TIP. Um, but 
the New Visions 2050 plan recommends a move to zero strategy um, and continuing to look at roadway design and uh, safety planning in a way that's always reducing risks, considering community context, and really, again, making that long-term commitment um, and cultural shift to a safety culture. So with that, I'm gonna pass it to Carrie Ward, who's gonna talk about CDTC's safety planning initiatives. And Carrie, if you just let me know when you want me to move to the next slide, I will do that. Sure, thanks. All right, so this is uh, just the uh, summary of the things that I am going to talk about here. So next slide, Jen. Um, so these are non-motorized, uh, so it's pedestrian and bicyclist crash crashes, the trend in the capital region through um, 2020, um, which are numbers that we just um, approved here um, with our our safety performance measures at our table. Um, so you can see that the, this is number, not rate, but the number of fatalities and serious injuries for pedestrians and cyclists um, did go down in 2020. Um, although I will note that the there were fewer cars driving on the road at that time as well. Next slide. Um, so the local road safety action plan that we have um, has a number of emphasis areas in it. One of those is vulnerable roadway users, which does include pedestrians. It also includes bicyclists and motorcyclists. The document has a lot of analysis of the crashes and the crash types and the roadway types in it. Um, but I think one of the interesting points in it for this presentation is the municipal overrepresentation by population for just pedestrian crashes. Um, so by county, in Albany County, it's the city of Albany and Water of Lead are overrepresented by their population within the county. In Rensselaer County, Troy and Hoosick Falls, in Saratoga County, Saratoga Springs, Edinburgh, Greenfield, Milton, the town of Stillwater, uh, Wilton, Schuylerville, and the village of Waterford, and in Schenectady County, the city of Schenectady. Next slide. Um, New York State does have a pedestrian safety action plan. As uh, Jen mentioned earlier, um, one of the recommendations that it had in there was to launch a safety project solicitation that provides highway safety improvement program funding, which is a dedicated funding source for municipalities to implement a systemic safety program on locally owned roads. Um, so next slide, Jen. Um, I wanted to highlight for the last solicitation that was done under this program, the projects that were funded in the capital region. Um, so th that's in the city of Albany, uncontrolled and signalized intersections, um, city of Rensselaer, six signalized intersections, Clifton Park um, got funding to do some uncontrolled crosswalks and five signalized intersections and the city of Schenectady with 10 signalized intersections. Next slide. Um, we also have have had for a number of years um, a program for many grants for traffic safety education and outreach. Um, the current version of it focuses on vulnerable road users, including pedestrians, and the point is to encourage proactive and protective safety behaviors. Um, we are uh, currently funding two types of projects, demonstration projects um, for temporary infrastructure to demonstrate that infrastructure on roadways, and then also traffic safety events led by local police departments. Um, this solicitation is still open right now, although projects do need to be completed by the end of this calendar year. Um, one example from the last year that we funded was a slowdown campaign along the Albany Hudson Electric Trail um, in the town of East Greenbush. It was by the town's um, police department. That's a trail that was recently opened. So it was a, there were new crossings at roadways. So they did a bike patrol monitoring pedestrian crossing process and then on the trail side and then marked patrol units monitoring the, the um, motor vehicles at the roadway crossings. Next slide. Okay, and so um, now I'm going to pass it over to Joe Chung to talk about the pedestrian lighting primer. And Joe, you should be able to share your screen. 
Yeah, I'm going to try and see what happened. Uh, can you see? Yes. Okay, so I'll put it in presentation mode. So uh, thank you for the opportunity to present the pedestrian lighting primer. This primer was published uh, earlier this year, probably around late April or May. Uh, and um, kind of wondering why do we need to provide lighting at nighttime? So I want to provide a little bit of background and the reason why we're doing uh, putting together the pedestrian lighting primer. Um, a lot of factors come into play. When you look at the data, um, you can see that um, the total number of daytime fatality is about the same as that in the nighttime. But since only 25% of the vehicle mile travel occur at night, hence the nighttime fatality rate is about three times of that uh, of the daytime rate. Now, a lot of factor when it comes to you know affecting the visibility of pedestrian. Uh, obviously, you know, roadway geometric, you know, whether the road is on, at a curves or at a tangent section, available site distance, uh, and then you have crossings at the intersection or at mid block. Uh, is there a lot of traffic interruption? And then is there any lighting uh, in the area and also ambient lighting from the neighborhood? Um, so, Pearl Harry also have. Uh, crash modification factor uh, in terms of installing either lighting at intersection or uh, on the row section itself. Take a look at the data. Earlier on that particular um, slide, we were focusing more on just the overall nighttime fatality, but this particular graph deals more with pedestrian fatality. Um, the pedestrian fatality have been increasing ever since uh, 2009 all the way to 2019 from 20, around 2800 uh, percentage of the nighttime pedestrian fatality to about 4510 and then it increased to uh, even for 2020 data is about 4795. Uh, so overall, it's about 76% of the pedestrian-related fatality uh, occur at nighttime or the period of uh, darkness. If you look at, you know, the overall, this particular figure shows that the pedestrian fatality, uh, as it's broken down by race, it shows that the minority and the disadvantaged community uh, oftentimes experience a disproportional burden uh, of pet fatality at nighttime travel in dark condition. Um, you know, especially on neighborhood where uh, some of the underserved neighborhood where the resident rely more on transit to travel to and from work. So they have to wait for the bus to come and even uh, getting on and off and all that uh, sometimes lighting is not always available. And sometimes, uh, even though they may be available, um, the outage and all that, and the light is not uh, replaced in a timely fashion as well. This particular slide shows a little bit of uh, you know, the type of effect of lighting for pedestrian. Um, one of the key thing about pedestrian that, you know, population that really going to be affected by lighting, if we can provide better lighting, is the school age children. Um, especially around this time of the year where some state uh, practice the daylight saving time, uh, open time, the school age children would have to, uh, for walker, would have to walk along the sidewalk and they are usually smaller in size and it's harder to see. And then if they have to, even though, you know, a lot of time we have crossing guard and all that, but at time, um, children have a tendency to just cross the road, uh, not necessarily on the crosswalk. And their judgment sometimes is not very reliable. So all the more we need to provide better visibility 
for uh, school age children as they travel to and from um, the school or attend some other school related activities. So we put together this primer and it was based on a the research result uh, from a federal highway study called uh, Street Lighting for Pedestrian Safety. However, as most of you are familiar with it, uh, all research documents are very technical. They're not exactly, uh, you know, they're all more geared towards uh, folks that are very familiar with uh, terminology and design and all that. And, and so Fell Highway fell with such a lighting, with such an important uh, recommendation coming out or generated by this research report, we feel that we should put together uh, this pedestrian lighting primer, which in essence target the safety practitioner, um, provide basic information so that folks can truly appreciate the complexity of designing uh, lighting for pedestrian. Um, the primer is divided into five sections. Uh, I'm not going to go through that. Uh, just in section two, it highlights a design process, both as an overall and also gear specifically towards uh, pedestrian safety. And then in the section three, it includes a design example that safety practitioner can follow uh, to look at how a particular uh, example, you know, with uh, pedestrian crossing, transit stop, and all that. Um, you know, how design uh, are put together and selected from the uh, available design criteria. Um, this is a flow chart that um, shows the overall lighting design process. So from warranting, which is in essence determining uh, based on either ASTO uh, or tech guy or um, illuminating engineering society uh, where the lighting is needed uh, all the way through taking the different kind of criteria uh, and then get to a point where they would complete the design and then send it into installation. Uh, different type of uh, design criteria. Uh, the more major one, as I mentioned, is under um, Illuminating Engineering Society that actually look at in according to road classification for that particular lighting type. And then there's ESTO, which use a slightly different criteria. Then other things come into play, such as as all of us travel on the roadway, we would at time notice that they are glare as we drive towards a street light on the roadway. And those are the things that we have to take into account to make sure that it doesn't create these uh, this comfortable glare that could affect uh, a driver as they navigate through the roadway. Um, this particular flow chart deals solely with uh, for pedestrian. So as you can see that when you look at the pedestrian based uh, lighting design, you kind of start out and you take into a lot of factor, right? As outlined here. Um, is the crosswalk, is it, is crosswalk involved? And then also what about the sidewalk or walkway? Is it a more of a separate pedestrian pathway or is this something right next to the curve along the road? So all of those affect the light level that's recommended for a lighting facility because we want to make sure that uh, when the pedestrian navigate through the sidewalk, um, not only they can be seen, and then as they then enter into a crosswalk, uh, they should be able to see uh, oncoming vehicle and also be spotted by the vehicle that coming towards the crosswalk. So all these recommendations come into play. Uh, and then uh, at the, towards the very end, we also have to determine are these kind of street light type of Luminaire, which is usually 20 feet or lower, or is this something that is higher that serve dual purposes, basically providing lighting on the roadway as well as the sidewalk. 
other things that uh, really need to uh, consider as well is Federal Highway always look for uh, data-driven uh, design. So we want to make sure that we have data that show lighting is truly needed. And one of the factor obviously is crashes, but then other factor that I mentioned before, which deals more with, uh, we can call it risk factor, which deal with road geometric, traffic volume, all that. So all those will come into play, uh, as well as when we do the design, we, we need to listen to the community, uh, do survey, and then hold community meeting to understand uh, their truly their need and what are the area they really, because that's the neighborhood that they live in. So they can provide, by interacting with them, they, you, can, you can gain a lot of insight as to how to design the system. And then on the other factor, uh, on the right side here, we conducted under the STEP program, which is safe transportation for every pedestrian. You guys are probably very familiar with that. We did a, like a little lighting scan tool. And those are uh, basically, we, we obtained through survey with state DOT on the most common factor that they use as a design, which include uh, average daily traffic, uh, roadway classification, type of land use, and then also crash data um, and pet bikes presence. And then the other thing that could affect the design is, is there a um, site distance issue? Uh, what about proper marking to separate the pedestrian as well as the, the bike traffic? Uh, what kind of intersection layout? Uh, are we talking about a roundabout? Are we talking about like an alternative intersection uh, and all that? Um, so a lot of it come into play. So they all kind of blend together when you have to design a, a pedestrian facilities, um, you know, lighting to, to help enhance the pedestrian visibility. Um, that is all I have for today. Uh, so uh, I assume that we will have questions later. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, stop sharing and turn the time back over to uh, Nate. Thank you, Joe. Uh, great information there. Um, let me go ahead and share my screen. <clears throat> Dropped properly. All right. All right. Um, thank you uh, so much. Um, uh, I'm very happy to be here today. Um, again, uh, Nate Owens, a senior planner with the town of Bethlehem. Um, Bethlehem is, uh, I think, regarded as a relatively walkable suburb uh, within the Capital District, and um, wanted to take the opportunity today to um, give a high-level look at um, the organizational structures, the, the different teams and processes um, and mechanisms the town uses uh, to um, encourage and, and create a pedestrian-oriented environment. Um, and. Uh, focus on pedestrian and, and bicycle safety. Um, I'll be going over four main areas um, that the town's involved in um, on this front. Um, and really it's a it's a team effort uh, to address um, pedestrian safety concerns in town. Um, we've got a, a staff a working group, um, and a bicycle and pedestrian committee that are that are very dedicated. Um, <clears throat> we've got uh, community education efforts, um, some uh, various planning um, activities for active transportation, including pedestrian safety. Um, and then we've uh, codified uh, a number of uh, the, the best practices uh, for um, pedestrian safety and uh, provision of, of uh, pedestrian infrastructure, um, codified those so that um, our uh, development review process uh, really helps helps to solidify uh, and expand 
um, pedestrian access and safety uh, within the town. Um, so I'm going to start off with the first important team, um, our Traffic Pedestrian Management Committee. Um, this is an interdepartmental staff committee uh, made up of uh, planning staff, uh, including the planning director, myself, um, the highway superintendent, the town supervisor, town engineer, um, uh, deputy uh, police chief, uh, the bike and pedestrian committee chair, um, and then and then others. Um, and this group really uh, triages traffic and pedestrian related comments that, that come into various town staff. Um, and then we uh, track the next steps on these items, um, do research uh, or look into uh, what what's needed to resolve uh, that comment, um, if that's possible, and then follow up with uh, the resident or, or business uh, person who submitted, um, submitted the comment. Um, this is uh, not a, a necessarily an easy undertaking. I think we've we've got uh, 250 plus items uh, that we've that we've been looking at. Um, you know, on the on the latest spreadsheet, uh, that does include some some items that have been closed out over time. But each month, we we seem to to have a growing list. Um, and yeah, we we work off of a large spreadsheet. Uh, you know copy of the comment, who made it, their contact info, um, and then a, a staff person that's been assigned, um, and then the history of, of that item. And so uh, each month we, we return and talk as a group through um, a lot of different resident concerns. And um, it, it's often the case that, um, you know, we can address some of these items or, or you know, start planning for, for these items um, on the list. But sometimes we need to, uh, you know, contact other agencies, uh, whether it's NISDOT uh, or, or the county to, uh, to uh, you know, consult, consult them on, on items as well. Um, and, you know, and a lot of the ma major roadways in town are, are state roadways, and, and that's likely the case for uh, other municipalities uh, in the region. Um, some of the concerns we typically get are related to, uh, as far as this committee goes, uh, speeding, um, crosswalk requests, sidewalk requests, um, accessibility concerns, um, and then uh, Confusing intersections and and all of these items really um, involve pedestrian safety, and so um, you know this is this is really a I think a a valuable process for the town to um, to really be looking at each each comment that comes in um, and and try and uh, try and address them. Um, the town is also it's included um, or created uh, a separate sidewalks at town of Bethlehem.com email address to uh, help make sure that um, comments are, are are coming into the the committee and, and being addressed and that residents um, have a, a point of contact or, or several points of contact that um, you know easy easy to get their comments submitted and uh, give them some confidence that um, the town will, will be taking them seriously and addressing them. Um, one example of, a, of an item that required some, some work with uh, New York State DOT, um, uh, crosswalks on state roads and you know, especially busy ones. Um, we worked with uh, DOT um, to evaluate for uh, advanced warning signage, um, through their uh, pedestrian safety action plan, uh, you know, there are standards for uh, advanced warning signage um, and striping, and this really can in increase the visibility of a, of a crosswalk. Uh, and so, this was a crosswalk on Ellesmere Avenue, uh, which is a state roadway. Um, the markings are worn. The, the signage for the crosswalk is, is older. Um, and so 
really updating updating the signage can really increase visibility and increase pedestrian safety. So the next team I want to uh, to look at is the uh, bicycle and pedestrian committee. Um, the town is lucky to have eleven uh, volunteer committee members. Um, they've got a, a wealth of experience and um, a passion for um, for pedestrian and bicycling um, activity within the town. Um, they are an advisory group appointed by the town board, um, but uh, provide lots of feedback to staff and then present to the town board um, on occasion with uh, their advice um, on specific uh, issues. Um, the committee has uh, been known to have separate smaller subcommittees work on specific small projects. Um, sidewalk maintenance has been a recent topic uh, within town. Uh, there's lots of uh, sidewalks that have had uh, deferred maintenance over the last uh, 20, 40 years and um, sidewalk maintenance has emerged as a, a critical issue within the town. So um, prioritizing those those maintenance projects, working with the uh, highway superintendent um, has been a, an ongoing process. Um, other uh, subcommittees within the group have looked at uh, the priority network map, which I'll, I'll show in a, a little bit, and uh, social media efforts, as well as uh, we one of the members is a uh, liaison to uh, the school districts within town. Um, an example of one of their projects um, is uh, understanding uh, the non-compliance at, at crosswalks within town. They did some research, found some other communities um, in Massachusetts, I believe, who had tried out uh, what are called CD flags, orange flags that kids can grab and uh, grab off of the pole here and um, use them to uh, kind of flag, flag cars, uh, alert their presence and uh, in the crosswalk, uh, just to improve visibility. Um, and this change is, is cheap and has uh, received a lot of positive feedback so far. Um, here's the uh, bicycle and pedestrian uh, priority network map. Um, and this uh, helps um, you know, both staff, elected officials, and others uh, understand what where are the priority roadways for um, whether you know, sidewalks, other pedestrian um, safety infrastructure, signage, um, widen shoulders, um, or other things, crosswalks, um, good for prioritizing new uh, new sidewalk investments as well. Um, and uh, our uh, our code does refer to, to this this map, um, so it does tie in with. Uh, our development reviews uh, with the planning board. Um, I'm going to touch on education a little bit. Um, education is is a critical focus, um, as much of our environment is really built for the automobile. Uh, a lot of extra work is is necessary to to make uh, drivers aware of, of pedestrians, um, and in, unfortunately. Uh, you know, a lot of that is is making sure pedestrians are visible to cars, um, and um, there there are efforts with um, just a behavior, understanding um, you know what's what's safe, uh, what's safe to do, walking at night, um, be visible. Uh, if you're riding a bike um, and you're you're a kid. Um, don't fly out of the driveway into the middle of the, the roadway. Uh, so uh, some of these education efforts um, you know, include, we have a, an annual walk and roll fest that helps teach those bicycle skills to children. Um, and uh, we actually take advantage of that, that mini grant um, as far as uh, this, this event goes each year. Um, the Bike and Peg Committee have a, uh, a couple of social media accounts, Facebook and Instagram. And uh, they post um, educational inf information to that uh, or to those accounts. Um, and then we've got various uh, other uh, awareness materials, um, lawn signs, 
uh, brochures and, and et cetera. Um, so here's some photos of the walk and roll fest and then some of the posts from our social media. Um, in uh, the rest of 2022 and uh, 2023, uh, the town will be conducting, um, we're really embarking on a pedestrian safety campaign. Um, so we've hired a, a firm um, called Civic Eye. Um, they're out of uh, New Jersey, I believe. And they've had experience working on compelling messaging for uh, transportation and safety related projects. Um, so this is a major project that will involve a bike and peg committee and, and others in the town um, to help raise awareness around um, and expectations around pedestrian safety. So um, that includes branding, uh, development of collateral materials uh, and um, radio and, and video uh, spots. So more, more to come on this from, from us here in Bethlehem. Um, on to the, the next major topic area um, is uh, planning for active transportation. So um, it really has become part of the culture in, in Bethlehem. And um, you know, I think we're, we're lucky for that. It's not the, the case everywhere that um, you know, these considerations are are kind of part of the organizational organizational and um, community uh, culture, um, but we we do we integrate all uh, pedestrian considerations into all areas and scales of, of planning. Um, and I think uh, you know if you're looking to create a, a better culture, um, you know start start to do that. Start to talk about the value of of uh, pedestrian safety and infrastructure. Um, in your plans, uh, in your project reviews, um, I think talking about it, um, you know, more and more uh, really helps people, uh, really helps the topic gain traction. Um, and we look beyond the transportation plan, uh, really. Um, demographic shifts, uh, so just like aging in place, um, you know, that implicates uh, sidewalks, crosswalks, pedestrian infrastructure. Economic development, um, having a walkable, fun uh, district or destination in town, um, that's going to spur economic development. Um, connecting residents to parks and recreation resources. Um, and then even uh, looking at a topic like urban forestry, uh, the town put together uh, with the consultant help uh, community forestry management plan a couple years back. And um, as part of the street tree inventory that was conducted, um, we asked them to uh, tell us where some good spots for street trees are along uh, major roadways. And so um, these are a few examples of how you can really, um, you know, just start to think about, um, you know, what's the relationship between the roadway um, and what's happening uh, on on the property adjacent to the roadway, and how how can uh, how can we um, integrate pedestrian um, considerations into, into our planning efforts? Um, an example is the um, 2022 comprehensive plan update that the town recently finished. Um, you know, we tried to, oh, going back just a little bit, um, elevating right here, sorry, elevating. Um, pedestrian safety and active transportation um, as high as possible in, in different plans, uh, establishing you know, values or principles that include pedestrian safety, um, including it in, in your mission or vision, um, and then and having some concrete, um, you know, some, some specific goals around pedestrian safety. Um, those are good ways to help generate strategies and actions that are very specific and will will help um, uh, turn the turn the community discussion towards um, you know providing providing that safe pedestrian infrastructure. So here's an example of that um, our values statements included you know walkable town, multimodal infrastructure, uh, an interconnected street network, um, our vision, 
um, included uh, looking towards having enlivened streets and public spaces, um, expansion of active transportation infrastructure, um, and then goals in the plan included aligning um, complete streets and land use policies, providing a complete, safe, active transportation network, um, and then goals that implicate pedestrian safety as well, optimizing hamlet density, shortening vehicle miles traveled, um, and then expanding opportunities for physical activity. Um, and when you're when you're doing planning, um, you know planning projects, don't forget to help people visualize what the all the the changes that are being discussed. Um, help visualize what those changes would look and feel like, um, as that really helps connect the dots and um, help people really understand better and imagine how um, you know some pedestrian safety measures can really have consequences for other areas of planning, such as economic development or aging in place, um, climate action, um, or just in encouraging healthy lifestyles. Um, going from you know, a condition like that to something like that, you can start to see how um, you know, those, those other uh, relationships between um, what are traditionally siloed areas of planning, how everything's really interrelated. Um, and lastly, I'll, I'll wrap up uh, quickly here. Um, you know, implementing uh, our plans with, um, you know, subdivision regulations and zoning law, um, it really integrates pedestrian safety into uh, the development review process. Um, applications for, for development projects, they come in, uh, they need to get a site plan or a subdivision approval, and they have to uh, follow the, the regulations um, and guidelines in, in town code. So um, what that means for subdivisions is um, the, the planning board and, and town staff are going to look out the, the layout of a, of a proposed subdivision and street and the street connectivity proposed. Um, does a subdivision connect to adjacent developments? Um, or are they, um, you know, only only have one or two um, points of access to a to a major roadway and are ignoring uh, possible connections to to other neighborhoods. Um, <clears throat> if new streets are proposed in a subdivision, a uh, sidewalk, um, if it's on a collector road, might be requ a required improvement. Um, Street trees and street lighting are, are requirements typically of subdivisions. Um, and if a project is a suitable spot for a, for a sidewalk, um, you know, the installation might be required or an easement might be necessary um, or a contribution for future sidewalk improvements might, might also be warranted um, and requested. Um, and then when it comes to site plans, there are a number of different areas where uh, pedestrian safety come in here, um, site access and circulation. Um, in a lot of cases, the discussion around this is mostly for vehicles, but really it's a great opportunity to talk about pedestrian uh, access and how they're getting uh, into a site, through a site, um, and talking about what types of conflicts might be present between pedestrians and vehicles. Um, Cross-site access or uh, connections to any uh, trails that are adjacent to the site um, or within the site. Um, driveways are, are an important consideration. Um, you know, having concrete or another different uh, material or pattern continue through the driveway to um, improve the visibility of the, the space where a driver can expect a pedestrian. Um, building and parking location. Um, it's not always about the, you know, the surface or facility that a pedestrian is traveling on. Creating a, 
a comfortable and welcoming environment for pedestrians. Um, we'll bring you know more of them, and having more pedestrians, more pedestrian activity. Um, you know, as a driver, you notice when you're entering an area where it looks like there's a lot of pedestrian activity, um, and you know to some degree it's un an unconscious reaction, but um, you you do kind of slow down, and so um, really creating that comfortable environment, uh, buffering. Um, you know, trying to manage those uh, vehicle and and um, pedestrian conflicts, uh, you know, landscaping. Uh, there's a lot of opportunity here for for you to consider um, uh, the different sites and and how to how to keep pedestrians safe. Um, so that's it for me, and um, I'm looking forward to your questions uh, at the end. Thanks, Nate. Um, we have a question, but we'll just get through the last couple of slides and then we'll go to that. Okay. Um. okay. So getting back into um, the last few slides to wrap this up, um, some pedestrian safety planning resources and tools available. Um, of course, if you go to the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, NHTSA's website, there's lots of great information there. Um, there's a walkability checklist that your community can use to identify um, problems um, in, in your community. Also, Federal Highway Administration has a lot of resources, particularly, you know, we would like to point out the proven safety countermeasures um, on, on their website, and those are categorized by mode or, or type. Um, and the Governor's Traffic Safety Committee, that's a New York State agency, there's a lot of pedestrian safety resources there. You can also request um, some of the CBC materials that have been developed by DOT and Department of Health. The New York State Association of MPOs has a safety education toolkit um, with a number of traffic safety um, resources and tools. A lot of them are education and outreach types of things, but some of them are related to planning um, and um, design guidance. And then, of course, on CDTC's website, if you go to the Capital Coexist webpage, We've developed and um, are linking to a number of resources there. There's a walk and roll to school toolkit that's really geared for schools. Um, if you're in Albany County, there's a complete streets lending library. And then we have a number of materials that uh, we're, we distribute um, by request. All of the previous New Visions webinars have been recorded. Um, and uploaded to our YouTube channel. You could also find them embedded on our website. One um, recent webinar that you may be interested in, and I did see there was a question about this in August, we did a webinar on rectangular rapid flashing beacons. Um, so RRFBs and other pedestrian, uh, mid-block pedestrian crossing treatments. Um, so you can find that on our YouTube channel, but it's also on our website. Upcoming webinars, we do this every month. Next month, we'll have a webinar on infrastructure. And um, now that the tip has been um, adopted here at CDTC, what you should know if your project is on the tip. We continue to implement new visions, of course, through this learning series, but also through the Transportation Improvement Program and the Unified Planning Work Program, which we recently opened um, a solicitation for. We've, we, we are making up to a million dollars in funding available to cities, towns, villages, and counties and member organizations in the CDTC area for um, planning assistance. There's a very wide uh, range of eligible project types. We encourage you to take a look at the website, look at the guidelines. Um, if you are considering applying, there is a workshop 
uh, October 20th, it's not Wednesday, it's Thursday, apologies for that typo. Um, so this Thursday at 1 p.m., there is a workshop. It will go right through the guidance and explain the application process. Uh, you can also request a pre-application meeting with CDTC. Complete applications are due November 30th, which is a Wednesday. So with that, um, we'll move on to questions. Uh, we do have a couple of questions. So the first question is actually for Nate. Um, how you deploy? How did you deploy RFBs at Midblock Crosswalks in Bethlehem? I'm back. Um, so I, yes, I there's there's one RFB on Delaware Avenue um, that was installed as part of um, uh, Delaware Avenue Complete Streets project. And, um, uh, streetscape enhancement project. Um, we do re get requests for RRFBs elsewhere in town, uh, mid-block crossings, and then um, at the New Glendamont roundabout, uh, they were included in, in that, um, <clears throat> that uh, project, um, or they haven't been installed yet there. Um, right now, we're discussing with New York State DOT, um, RRFBs do need to meet certain um, uh, warrants uh, to be installed on a state roadway. Um, there's a number of, uh, I think, different criteria, and, and the, there's, a, there's a guidance document published by DOT. I think it's a TSMI. I think that's the acronym. Um, but basically a guidance document that it, it's actually looking to... Um, the city of Boulder uh, and what they've used for warrants for uh, RRFBs. Um, it's basically 20 pedestrians within an hour time frame, um, and you know there's there's a tiered system there for number of pedestrians in a given time frame, and then um, uh, elderly folks and children count as two. So um, you do kind of have to meet some warrants, at least if you're if it's being done on, on a state uh, roadway. And then um, the town's uh, expected to install and, and then maintain maintain that infrastructure. So um, you know it is something we're we're looking at. Um, and then you know they're 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 not cheap. It's uh, 25 grand to 30 something grand um, depending on on what models and stuff you're looking at. So I hope that helps. Thanks, Nate. Um, another question. Um, uh, Jen asked if funding for pedestrian lighting planning, design, and construction is typ typically available for TIP and UPWP. I can confidently say yes. In the past, we have funded planning studies to look at conversion to LED. Um, lights and looking at different strategies for um, it, for deploying LED lighting and what other kind of technologies can be paired with LED street lights to improve pedestrian safety and general traffic safety and public safety. Um, as far as lighting for TIP, uh, that I would have to look into, but that is a good question. Um, and then, uh, Joe, a question for you. Can you talk to um, what small municipalities without engineering staff can do themselves if they want to do a review of their street lighting? What are some basic things they should look for? Um, are you talking about an actual, like, um, a design that is furnished by a contractor, or are you talking about from scratch that the staff wanted to do it on their own? Do you know? So this was my question, Joe, just because I know there's a municipality in our region who's doing this. Um, they they just have a, a staff person that is has been assigned to them using their own time themselves to, you know, go out and make some kind of judgment or, about their street lighting. I see. Okay. Yeah. Um, I would suggest that, you know, well, first of all, it all depends on are you uh replacing the old style high pressure sodium with 
an LED uh, lighting system because they are quite different. And the way the light is um, produced from those fixtures is completely different. So you can't just uh, do a one-on-one uh, -on -one replace, just place a different uh, lighting luminaire on top of the same pole. So you do need to design accordingly. Um, if it is for example, on an urban street where there's a lot of ambient lighting, then you have to take that into account as well versus a subdivision neighborhood where there's not a lot of um, other lighting other than uh, provided by street light. So it is something fairly complex. Um, there are resources available uh, in terms of helping safety practitioner to gain a better understanding of lighting design and all. Um, and we are in also in the process of putting together a lighting handbook, which in essence provide a lot of recommendation as to how to design light. Uh, it won't be available until possibly early next year, but these are the resources that could help folks to actually, um, you know, when they have to sit down and try to figure it out, um, they can get some resource there. However, I would say that uh, lighting design itself, you're gonna have to have some experience in terms of knowing how the different type of light uh, and how you can, uh, for example, reduce glare when you put the light out, putting in shielding and all that. So it's not as a, a really simple process. Thank you. And I'm going to put a link to um, the municipal smart city streetlight conversion and evolving technology guidebook that CDTC worked with the city of Saratoga Springs on in the chat, if anyone is interested. Um, Nate, another question for you. Who is championing the who is championing the pet safety campaign for Bethlehem and how did you achieve funding support? Well, I'd say that um, it really emerged both from uh, the staff group um, and the bicycle and pedestrian committee. Um, and em emerged from discussions in, in both groups. And so it just kind of clicked. Uh, I think the, the bike and ped community really um, said, hey, we, we, need a, we need some sort of campaign, some sort of marketing campaign. Um, and that, that kind of followed some realizations after the Delaware Avenue Complete Streets Project um, was voted down, um, or the, the bond funding was, was voted down, which essentially kind of table of the project. Um, and so we're, it kind of fits a lot of different needs um, right now. And um, the bike and ped committee will be involved and in, in they're championing it. Um, and uh, let's see what, I think there was another part of the question I didn't really get to. Um, but how did, how did it how achieve, you achieve funding, funding support? support? Um, I think there was just uh, the the political will to uh, to have that to have that done. So um, you know, uh, I think the town supervisor um, uh, and the kind of subcommittee that's been developed for that project um, kind of took that before the the town board and and got the funding uh, to to do that. So. About uh, 50 grand. Great. Done for that. Thanks, Nate. Any um, last questions? I don't see any more in the chat or in the QA. Um, I want to thank everyone for attending today and thank you to all of our panelists. Um, and we've been recording, so you can find this webinar up on the CDCC YouTube channel by the end of the week. Um, and thank you, and we hope to see you again next month.
Thank you, Nate. Thank you, Joe. Thank you, Carrie. Thank you. Thank you.